Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Justin Sevenker. Um, I work with Erica at Lorraine County Community College. I'm an English professor there, and I also direct the writing program. Um, a couple of years ago, we also launched a dedicated writing center for our students, and I'm the director of that as well. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that during my presentation. So it's good to be here with you folks. Um, Julio? Hi, everybody. Hey, my name is Julio Moreno. I work in Columbus State in institutional effectiveness. That is the office that handles the data in reports, surveys, et cetera. Hey, I'm a senior analyst, and I have been in the college for 14 years. Um, I started my, my tenure there as a faculty and tutor. Then I have been faculty, tutor, a reporter, researcher, and now analyst. Then um, I'm happy to share now uh, in this presentation with Dr. Kelly Hogan. Kelly. Thank you, Thank you Julio. Uh, my name is Kelly Hogan, and I have the pleasure of working with Julio at Columbus State. And I have been with Columbus State around 28 years or so. Um, I started off as a faculty member and teaching math uh, in the developmental uh, courses, and then um, done a number of things, uh, College Credit Plus, and then uh, led a Title III grant, uh, still working uh, on the end, end point of that, but am now um, in the Office of Academic Affairs. Uh, and so we're super excited to be with you today and recognize a couple of faces. So that's that's awesome. Um, good to see you all today. So we're going to start today's session with a couple of polling questions to get to know you just a little bit. So hopefully right now you are seeing two polling questions. The first one, uh, if you could select one answer, asking how well you know the institutional or IR staff at your institution. And of course, those offices often have different names, institutional effectiveness, research, whatever. And then second question, does your institution provide one set of data for everyone to access or use? So if you could take a moment and answer those two questions. And then Laura will be sharing the results um, of that poll. So again, how well do you know your IR folks or your IR contact? And does your institution provide one set of data for everyone, if you could respond? All right, Laura, do we have results? All right, so here we go. Um, it looks like a little over half uh, claim to be friends or at least know who they are. Um, and I would encourage the, the other half who maybe don't know who they are, or are not friends with one of your um, IR uh, colleagues to consider that, especially as you listen to this presentation, because first of all, the, at least the IR people I know, they're really great people and they love to be supportive and help. And so, um, and, and I will also say that the more you get to know them and um, communicate with them, it's often a lot easier uh, to think about what type of data you want, how you want it, and, and just kind of work through that together, which um, always makes um, having the data more productive uh, because you're getting what you need to answer your question. Um, and it, it, for those of you who say I'm not aware of IR staff or that office at your institution, um, some may be very small, obviously, but uh, pretty much every institution is going to have um, an IR office because if nothing else, everybody has to do the state reporting uh, that's necessary. So um, again, you can, you can find them, I'm sure, uh, and, and then uh, get to know them. And hopefully our presentation today will emphasize the importance of that. And then does your institution provide one set of data for everyone to access or use? And you can see we've got a 40-60 split there. Um, which which I think will be addressed uh, coming up in the presentation. So um, it certainly does make it easier if we're all working from the same page of information. But um, again, data can be complex. So we'll leave it at that for now. All right, so thank you for that. Our next question um, is one where we're gonna ask you to use the chat. Uh, and so um, you should see the chat option at the bottom of the screen probably and you pull it up but here's the question for you um what three things come to mind when you think about the phrase 
data socialization. And Laura's put the question in the chat as well. So if you could uh, respond to that question, what comes to mind when you think about the phrase data socialization? There's no wrong answer. So if you could just take a moment, put a couple thoughts in the chat. We have a couple of responses here. Average people need to understand what data can be used for. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of folks aren't comfortable. They consider data a four letter word and they, they just are, are nervous, just like they get just like math is a four letter word. Right. So um, and everybody needs to understand what's going on, um, helping people to understand the data, complicated, complicated. Um, but never heard the, of the phrase before, maybe sharing of data among peers, um, having a data informed foundation uh, to common communication and understanding of overall goals and strategy, data that's used in everyday practice. Again, someone else unfamiliar with the phrase, um, discussing data with others, common language. Um, so uh, accessibility for all, uh, using data for informed purposes, all great, great answers. And we're gonna talk more about about this concept, but um, uh, so, so I'll kind of leave it at that. We just kind of want to get a sense of where you are. And we have one last polling question to um, hear from you. Uh, uh, do you use data when determining how you teach in the classroom? If yes, please post a comment in the chat. Now, I don't know that all of you are classroom instructors, you know, currently, but I'm sure um, you've probably had experience in that, if not this semester, then maybe in the past. So have you used data when determining how you teach? Uh, yes or no? And then if you'd like to put any comments in the chat, that would be great. So we have a couple of, uh, so if you'd like to give us the poll results um, and we can see that, okay, so the majority of you do use uh, data in, when determining how you teach, which is wonderful um, to hear. Um, some say I would like to, to learn how to use data in the classroom. We use assessment data and CCP data. Uh, we use mostly qualitative data. Um, I ba uh, based on data I gleaned from a student survey I handed out. So some of you are obviously doing your own uh, in-class assessments that are helping you then hone uh, your work. Um, when I use data, it's simply from a brief survey. I'd like to learn how to use hard data. Um, and then um, classroom grad courses, qualitative comments from course evaluations, always good to, to reflect on what's uh, included in the course evaluations. Um, peer evaluations, those were some things that I so appreciated when uh, we had faculty peer um, review. Uh, I found that to be incredibly helpful because those people were doing the same, the same work every day uh, that I was. Um, persistence over time, GPA, and then surveys. So thank you for sharing uh, what you have. We ha are going to go ahead. Oh, one more. Qualitative data among other markers. Um, including major, first gen, so the status of, of uh, or information about your students who are in your classroom. Um, so we're gonna take some time now to kind of share some examples of how we are putting the use of data into practice in our classrooms um, and in our work. And our friends from Lorraine are going to start. So uh, with that, I think I'm turning it over to Erica. Great, thanks. I appreciate everybody, um, you know, all that feedback that we heard in the from the polls there, let me go ahead and get that up and going. Okay, so everybody should be seeing the presentation now. Um, so my name is Erica Fennick, I won't introduce myself again, but I'm gonna share some of the great work that we have going on at the institution. Um, and Justin is really gonna be bringing a lot of this to life in the application of it. So first, a little bit about Lorraine County Community College. We're located in Northeast Ohio. Um, back in 2020, we had about 10,000 students on our campus, and you can see that disaggregation there. Um, one of the things I want to point out on this slide in particular is that we have a refreshed vision after the pandemic. Uh, we took a pause to make sure that we were still headed in the direction that we wanted to, just, you know, with all of the disruption that was occurring. And so um, one of the big things that is relevant to our conversation today that 
that came out of that um, is that our foundational value is now equity for all in all that we do. And so that means that um, disaggregating data and looking critically um, at that data is a part of our DNA at the institution and is throughout all that we want to do. A um, little bit about our data approach. Uh, we have done a lot of listening. We've got um, a lot of different perspective here in our IR office. There are three of us. Um, and we have been kind of collecting over years in an iterative way, designing um, you know, data and information that supports our faculty members here at the institution. So um, was not done in a vacuum, but we do use a uh, tiered approach. So we have institutional data, program specific data and course level data available to faculty members. That uses a number of sources. So we're, we're looking at that quantitative data that is coming out of our PeopleSoft system and other places where we're collecting data and information about students. And then we also use qualitative and survey data. So we're really combining a number of sources in order to get a full picture um, of what's happening with our students. And then our focus for that, whenever we're sharing our data out, we want to make sure that it's actionable and is going to be meeting the needs of the faculty members so that way they can put that um, data to work to identify areas where they can make changes and tweaks and, and maybe redesign and rethink. Um, now that is all supported. Also, I wanted to shout out our, our teaching and learning uh, center, which is newly um, kind of reformed here at the institution, you know, to make sure that as we have data and information out there that we're also providing professional development resources and tools um, for folks to be able to access those those resources in order to be able to make those changes. Um, we also have some working teams where is are appropriate to kind of collaborate and have that um, redesign work all happen together. So one of the pieces that is kind of our, our flagship for our equity work when it comes to the data component of it, and I see Denise Douglas, who is our co-chair of our equity by design team is on here um, and is deeply familiar with our work on the equity side as well. Um, but wanted to share with you all here that we put together an equity progress update. We've been doing this since 2015. Um, now, granted, this is all of the data we made, well, I wouldn't say exhaustively all, but the, the vast majority of data that we have available at the institution that is disaggregated, we provide within this report. So it's in a singular point. Um, so if somebody wanted to go and find out a particular um, you know, kind of a set of experiences for our institution, they can go to this document and find it all in one spot. Um, what this does and the intention of this is not to be answering all of the, the questions that happen, but instead helping people to think about where their programs fit within this or what the what is the institutional context for what I'm seeing or experiencing in my programs and courses? Um, you know, how can I find out um, a little bit more information about maybe what is happening or occurring there? Are there new considerations for my, you know, the students that I serve in my program as a result of what I'm seeing in this? Um, so really kind of the the bringing kind of to light um, some of the things that, that are occurring here um, at the institution so that it can be applied um, then at the program level. And I can show that a little bit later. The next piece is our what matters most metrics. So we just, um, we had intentionally decided to have a set of KPIs at the institution that we disaggregated in a number of ways. So you see here on this screen, the ways in which we disaggregate that information. So every analytic within here or every metric within here is disaggregated by this. Um, what you see on the screen. There are 31 metrics within this. We know of those that there are four that are really, really highly impactful. Justin's going to talk through the application of this one in particular um, for our English um, metrics that you'll you'll see here in a little bit, but and how we use that data and information to make changes um, to our program offerings. But again, this is a tool that, that faculty use um, to kind of, again, sound check any changes that they've made because we do provide that data and information longitudinally um, and for them to also understand kind of some of the factors that are contributing to student success within the course or within the programs. Um, and then what learnings can we apply again from what we're seeing at the institutional level to that program specific level. 
we have a college-wide survey schedule. So you, have, you heard how we use system data. Now we also wanted to make sure that we're using our survey data in a meaningful way. Um, so we have a number of surveys that we administer on a rotating basis. Um, we actually are in, um, doing the, the national assessment of collegiate college campus climates um, this spring because of our some disruptions there that happened with COVID, but we try and stay as consistent to this as possible in order to collect the information, analyze that, kind of have it be vetted across the campus or processed across campus, and then to create different approaches to the programs, courses, or, or classroom experiences in order to address some of the findings before then administering it again. Um, so this is some of the information that we also include within our program reviews or um, some of the workbooks that we put out uh, across the campus. I wanted to point out one of our uh, pages from our program review. So this is a, a document that um, our office, uh, in working with our Office of Assessment and Accreditation, uh, Accreditation and Assessment of Student Learning puts together, um, where we actually have as much of the data and information that IR can get already populated within this, and the focus becomes um, the, the reflection and looking at that data and considering the various questions that we include. Um, one, of the, one of the pieces that we've added in here that is particularly targeted at equity is this, this big question concept. So what are those big questions that faculty members really want to dive deeper into um, and that they want to explore here you know, during that cycle of the program review? We also have a SOAR analysis at the end. We kind of shifted away from a SWOT and we're doing a SOAR. Um, and that SOAR also includes some probing questions for faculty to respond to. So not only thinking about um, kind of what the totality of their program review findings are, but then thinking about um, some of the various aspects of the program and to kind of help support any kind of uh, expansion or thinking about equitable learning outcomes, those types of things within it. Showing you here, uh, we we talked a little bit at the beginning about whether or not folks have one data source or whether there's multiple data sources. We're kind of that in between. Um, we have some where it's kind of that one stop for the data and information and other places where we have um, multiple sources or multiple pieces of information. Um, so what you see here on this screen is actually a picture of our website where we have uh, a number of dashboards available to faculty members. This is a self-service tool, so they can go out at any time and they can click on and access anything from enrollment to their program review data. So even if they're not up for program review that year, we are updating the data annually and they can go out and see maybe if they were anticipating some changes in, in some of the information um, or things like that. They can look at their course success rates, um, and then also their course assessment information. Um, and that allows for the faculty to member, member to monitor the impacts of the change. So again, being able to kind of reference over years um, and then allows for the analysis, um, you know, of those and the access to those data points when they need to have that information. So it's not um, us prescribing when they need it, but it's the faculty members really being able to go out and, and find that data and information to inform their decision making. One of the pieces that we disaggregate here at our institution is the assessment data. Um, this is a newer piece for us, but wanted to share it with you all that we are um, going through and for those learning outcomes uh, associated with the courses, we are disaggregating that information where available. So just um, kind of making sure that we're looking at all of the different aspects of the, the experiences of the students here at the institution um, through that disaggregation. We also use predictive analytics. This is something that um, faculty members do have to take a little bit of training to, in order to access. But once they have it, there's a wealth of knowledge in here that kind of stretches beyond what we would think of as traditional uh, course success rates. So it gives us a little bit deeper information about maybe where there's some hidden um, kind of things going on with the course. So is it that that tipping point grade is what they reference here um, is actually higher than what we would have anticipated as just kind of a, a, a passing grade or a grade similar to what other peer, 
courses would have for that particular level. Um, and faculty can go in and kind of drill down into that information. And of course, we're all here um, to help get into that information a little bit more and peel back some of the layers on one of that, but kind of that proactive um, support for, for faculty going through this. There's uh, kind of the questions that they can ask as they're in this tool and some proactive outreach that they can do within this as well. So they're able to actually communicate with students or have a list generated of those folks, let's say for this example here, um, that didn't earn a B or higher in so Sociology 151. And they could reach out to those folks to say, hey, um, you know, would you like some additional support or um, kind of do a sound check with students and check in with them. We also do some class analytics, and this part is really starting to get some traction. Um, we are uh, focusing right now on one particular course, which is our A&P course, um, and we've lovingly termed it the, our A&P Adventures team that is working um, on that particular course, but we do have some, some class level analytics um, and then are also supporting kind of some of that redesign work. So, um, you know, with the classroom analytics, you know, we're able to support faculty analyzing specific components with their online class. Um, so, you know, if they're looking to see where students are disengaging, um, we're able to support that data and information. And then the work is focused, this work is focused on um, the degree of engagement with the students. So really leveraging that LMS data in order to be able to do this and then applying um, that equity lens to this research as well. So we had um, some faculty members that took us up on that last year and we're continuing to gain some momentum with that particular aspect of our work. But one of the things that AMP Adventures are, are really um, diving into and, and using a what we hope will become the model for our institution. Um, we have done we have developed a set of metrics that will kind of um, give a health score of courses. Um, and those courses that that end up kind of in that critical bucket um, will then go for a, a 360 review and have that course care team is what you see it called here. Um, and there'll be a number of steps that are within that, uh, including a course review. So you see here within this, these are the, all of the different aspects that we support that work. Um, you know, in, in actually taking that holistic review to make sure that, um, you know, we're making tweaks and changes that will that will benefit students and that will um, help, you know, keep that course rigorous and also promote uh, student completion and success within that. Before we jump to Justin, I am going to share the equity progress update report just so you all have kind of a better idea of what is included in there because we've had a lot of questions about it. Um, if this is available out on our website, but here is just kind of the ground setting of who we are and an acknowledgement statement of just what we are doing with our work um, as it relates to equity here at our campus. Um, we are acknowledging that, that impact of COVID-19. We give some information about just kind of who we are in our refresh. Um, and then some of the, the real high level bullet points of what the equity by design team is working on and what else is happening across campus. And then if you get down into here, we really um, try and take sound bites from across the student experience, um, you know, at each one of those points of entry connection uh, progress and transition. So you start to see here that we've categorized that information, um, kind of looking at first that high school dual enrollment pipeline, and then getting into that entry point. So sense of belonging, which we have a survey in the field right now that we'll be able to add some, some to that, um, some more information to that. But we have also, you see, balanced in here um, you know, some narrative about what we have going on, but also some of the sound bites um, from the surveys that we have and then the data information as well. Um, and calling out student populations where we maybe don't have as much information or maybe it's not as, um, not a, a large population on our campus, but wanting to acknowledge the fact that they are included in our equity work. And so making sure um, this example here is, a parent, is parenting students. So providing the information that we can, again, to provide that context at, for faculty as they're going into their classrooms about 
who is there and how, how we are serving them can serve them. Stop sharing that. And turn it over to Justin. Oops. Erica, are you going to continue? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, let me did everything switched around. Thanks very much, Eric, and, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, um, as I said, I'm an English faculty member at Lorraine County Community College, um, and I'm going to be sharing a couple examples of the sort of work that the English faculty um, have done over the past seven or eight years with the data that um, Erica and her colleagues um, provide to us. So I'm going to give two different examples. Um, one of them um, is some work with our co-requisite English course, which largely happened before I joined, um, joined the college. And so I just really have the pleasure and honor of, of telling the story of the good work that was done before I sort of showed up on the scene. Um, and then the second example has to do with the launching of our new writing center um, a couple of years ago, which I've, I've been much more involved with. So um, I'm just going to give you sort of the, the sketch of, of these examples, and then I'm happy to dig deeper and, and answer any, any sort of further questions once we take questions at, at the end of the session today. Um, Erica, would you mind going to uh, the next slide for me, please? So um, the ways that the English faculty have, have been using data um, from um, from Erica's office is uh, threefold, I think. I mean, uh, the, the data first gives a sort of call to action to us. It, it really helps us to see what is not working well in our writing program, where we want to see improvements. Um, it allows us to measure our progress once we do start taking action on those various items. Um, and then we can we can use the data to really reassess our goals and, and our successes once, once we complete one of these projects. So I'm gonna try to give you some examples of, of all of that today. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Erica. The first project that we worked on, um, as I said, this is the this is the uh, the project that took place before I joined the college. Um, back in uh, leading up to 2014, uh, my colleagues dismantled a, a pretty robust developmental reading and writing sequence that we had at the college and replaced that sequence with a co-requisite support course that put students more quickly into the Gateway English course and provided them the support that they needed to be successful in that course. Um, and making that change has really just improved the overall completion in our Gateway English course uh, to, a, to a great degree. And uh, it's particularly encouraging to see the, the closed um, completion gaps, um, especially uh, for our students of our students of color. And so let me show you some of uh, some of the data that we use uh, to, uh, to to monitor that. Erica, if you could um, go to the next sequence. First, this is, oh, I'm sorry. If, First, this is this is the, the English sequence that I'm talking about. So before 2014, we had our Gateway English 161 course, um, but students could be placed either directly in that course or if they weren't quite ready for that course, they could have been placed anywhere on the sequence of developmental um, English courses. There were two developmental reading courses and two developmental writing courses. Some students might have to take maybe just one or two of these courses before they could enter English 161, but it's very possible that, uh, that a student maybe had to take all four of them. And so they had to spend a lot of time in coursework before they could even enter that gateway course. Um, and we know that if students can complete gateway English in the, English in the first year, that really uh, improves their chances of just being successful at our college overall. And so the fact that we were losing so many students in developmental English, the fact that students were just sort of getting stuck there um, was really hurting a lot of our about a lot of our completion numbers, as, as you can see on the next slide here. Um, in, in 2011 there, our overall um, number for students who attempted English um, didn't even break 50% um, students who attempted uh, to complete that gateway course in, in the first year of their, of their college experience. And so um, that by itself is, is something that, uh, you know, there's sort of a call to action and a need to change. But then once we start looking at the fact, once we disaggregate this data, for example, on the next slide, um, and we see that students who are placing directly into English 161, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. Over 70% over of them were completing that gateway course in, in the first year. But then there's a huge drop as we start seeing students who had to take the upper tier of those developmental reading and writing courses. And then the students who had to start even at the lower tier developmental reading and writing it was nearly impossible for them to complete those courses and their gateway English course in the first year. It was theoretically impossible or theoretically possible. There were 
um, you know, accelerated versions of those courses, those students really could have um, packed their schedules and, and perhaps have completed that gateway course, but um, it just really wasn't working for them for a variety of reasons that we discovered. And then on the next slide, once we look at um, a disaggregation based on based on race here, we see that um, white students at that top line were completing these courses at a much higher rate than um, our Latino students and our African American students. And so those achievement gaps um, were were the, the real problem for us to solve in, in our writing program. And so in order to do that, um, the next slide shows um, the replacement of, of that dev ed sequence. So now we have students again who place directly into English 161, but then um, we did our placements so that many of the students who would have once placed somewhere in that developmental education sequence, we're now putting them directly into English 161. And they're also taking a support course, English 061, which gives them the additional assistance and resources that they need to be successful in that English 161 course. So that they're completing that developmental component at the very same time that they're completing the gateway course. Um, there is still one sort of holdover um, dev ed reading and writing course, a combined course um, that very few students um, place into anymore, um, but, but it's just one course now rather than a sort of sequence of four. And even that starting this year, um, we are trying to replace with even an additional co-requisite course. And that's still being piloted at this time. Um, we're hoping that that can be very successful in, um, uh, in making some changes. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Erica. Um, so this was a heavy lift. As I said, I wasn't here for uh, for much of this, but it did involve a lot of work on how reassessing, reassessing how we place students so that we could distinguish those students who we could put into English 061 and help them be successful in that 161 course right away. Um, that involved a lot of collaboration with enrollment services. And then something that I did actually get to assist with once I joined the college was this ongoing um, professionalization of, of our composition instructors to help them teach this 061-161 course. Before, we had an entirely separate faculty of developmental English reading and writing instructors who worked with the students in those courses, but now those students um, are being placed right into English 161 with a group of instructors who um, often did not have experience working with that particular population of students and their learning needs. And so there was a lot of work that had to be done to um, prepare those faculty to, you know, to work with that with that population and make sure that we're giving them um, the tools that they need to include those students in their classroom and make sure that they can be um, make, make sure that they can be successful. So if, if you could go to the next slide, please, Erica. Um, so, so this is, I mean, this is always a great story to tell because we see those numbers go up. The, the work on this, the implementation of the 061 started in 2014. We immediately started to see our numbers going up. Um, here in 2019, uh, at, at the end of the data that I have here on this slide, we see just a tremendous increase in our in our completion rates. I haven't included the data here for 2020 and 2021. We all sort of know that the pandemic kind of did all sorts of crazy things to all of our numbers across the board, but um, eventually we hope to see that you know this upward trajectory um, continues uh, continues to go up. But certainly by 2019 we were seeing great success there. Um, and then on the next slide we can see that this even occurred once we go back to those disaggregations of data were placed directly into 161 up at the top. Even they are they are continuing to do better. Um, and then the students who would have once been placed down in a, the developmental sequence, even those, those gaps are being closed. So the middle green line there, um, these are students who are being placed into 061. So you can see that the students who are taking just the straight gateway course and the students who are taking the gateway plus the co-rec are essentially completing the, the gateway course at, at nearly the same rate. And that is just in, incredible to see. Um, the students who are placed in that final developmental reading and writing course, there's still um, some improvement there. This still poses a problem for us that 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 line is not shooting up, you know, quite as high as we would like to see it. And so we have some additional questions there. But but even there, we saw um, a, a jump in improvement. Um, so if you go, could go to the next slide, Erica, here's the disaggregation based on race as well. And so we can see the closing of, of those achievement gaps. Um, you know, again, not as much as we would like, but but certainly there's there's some improvement there. Um, and that's wonderful. I mean, our students of color are more likely than our white students to be placed in those developmental English courses. And so changing changing the sequence has, has helped us to change the, 
the, the success rates of, of those students. If you could go to the next slide, please, Erica. Um, so as I said, this made a significant difference, but um, shortcomings persist. And so um, the data helps us not only to sort of, you know, see what needs to happen, but to assess um, how successful we were and what needs to happen next. Depending on student placement, you know, some students are still more successful than others, especially those students who are placed in that remaining dev ed course. We still want to see those um, folks go up. There's still the issue of race and race and ethnicity. You know, we're not seeing um, a total close of those achievement gaps. And then um, on a later slide, I'll show you that there are remaining gaps between our traditional college age students and our adult learners. And so that's something that um, we want to explore as well. And so the the where I come in, the the story that um, uh, that I I have the most involvement in here is that in 20, 2020, we launched a dedicated writing center to help provide an additional layer of support onto this co-requisite to see if we can continue making making these improvements that um, that we started seeing once we implemented the co-requisite. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, Erica. Um, this is uh, the data that we received about our traditional versus our um, direct from our non-traditional and our, our direct from high school students. You can see when we implemented the co-rec there in 2014, the, the lines are, are going up, but the overall gap between our traditional and our non-traditional students is, is remaining about the same. And so that's, that's sort of a puzzler and something that is telling us that these students need some sort of additional layer of support so that they can be achieving up in that, you know, at least up into that 70 range, like our straight from high school students are. So um, if you could go to the next slide, Erica. Um, the Writing Center is part of a Title III grant that LCC received, and we launched this in 2020. It was all online at first because of the pandemic, but just starting last fall, we've actually had a physical presence on campus um, in a new Writing Center space. Um, we have dedicated English success coaches who um, are particularly qualified to work with students in our developmental courses, and so we're hoping that um, this will be a very powerful intervention to continue closing those achievement gaps. I always like to say that um, one of these coaches is a professor emeritus, one of the professors who actually invented English 061, and so he was on the top of my list to bring on staff as one of our coaches. The other professor who, who uh, invented English 061, Molly Chambers, is actually on this call today, and so I'm very excited that uh, that she is here because she, I mean, she's one of the people who made this happen and that's just, that's just incredible. Um, and so our, our goal here um, is over the five years of our grant, we'd really like to see, especially for those non-traditional students, to see a move from 43% completion to 55% completion. And so that's what we're going to be looking for um, as we, as we continue in this work. So on the next slide um, here, this this is this is the this is the chart that I'm going to be looking at in the coming years to see if the writing center can help us can help us close this gap. So, as I said, um, that's just a quick overview of of the work that we've been doing in English with the data that the Erica provides us. Um, and I'll I'll look forward to answering any questions that you folks have when uh, when we take them at the end of the session. Thanks thanks very much. And I'll I'll turn it over to our uh, our Columbus State colleague. Thank you, Justin. All right, I think we're going to bring up our slides. Thank you, Julio. Uh, so again, I'm Kelly Hogan. Uh, and uh, again, Julio and I are very excited to share with you what's happening in the in the data front at Columbus State. So um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Columbus State. We're going to talk um, a little bit about the goals of the college. We also have a, a wrapping up a Title III grant. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about availability of the data across the college, program review, uh, the impact of multiple interventions uh, on student success, our results and tying it together, um, and then some communication and engagement strategies that, that we um, have in place. All right, so Columbus State, uh, we were originally CTI or Columbus Technical Institute. Um, we are located in downtown Columbus, Ohio. We also have a second uh, campus in Delaware County, um, in uh, our Delaware campus. Uh, we have uh, several regional learning centers. Dublin is now co-located with um, OU, uh, Westerville at Otterbein, and then Bolton Field where we have our aviation and fire science program um, in the Grove City area. Um, and enrollment has been uh, around or had been around 27,000 students per semester um, in Central Ohio. 
So um, when we look at our demographics, um, you can see that um, uh, about 50%, 56% of our students are white, 20% Black or African American. And you can see, again, the dates um, and time frame of when this data was uh, collected uh, that we're sharing right now. Um, the majority of our students do attend part-time rather than full-time. Uh, slightly over half of our students are female. Um, we have, a, a like many institutions, a growing younger population, especially with the advent of College Credit Plus. Um, over a third of our students are Pell eligible. So kind of our progress, um, I think what you see in those last few bullets is um, kind of how we are demo how we demonstrated that our um, we are becoming more and more focused in our work around student success. We had joined Achieving the Dream in 2012. Um, we uh, focused on uh, goals that I'll share in our Title III grant, um, which is a five-year grant. Um, and then we, you know, as we continued to hone our strategies and look at our data, disaggregate our data, um, and then continue in a cycle of uh, continuous quality improvement, um, we did see some, um, uh, some ways we were addressing the gap. We were starting to close certain gaps. Um, we had closed a couple um, and we received some awards recognizing that like um, Achieving the Dreams Leah Meyer Austin Award in 2019 and a College Leader of Distinction in 2020. So these are the goals uh, that have been established uh, for the college. Um, and are really laid out in our Title III grant. And um, th these are kind of the things that we all uh, look at as our, our true north, if you will. Like this is, this is what we're really focusing on um, and the strategies that we, that we are implementing are designed to support these goals. Um, and these come, um, we, we look at things through a loss momentum framework, if you're familiar with um, completion by design work. Um, and if you saw in Erica's slide, um, they also are looking at the, um, the student progress from uh, connection through entry um, and progress completion and then workforce and transition and really focusing on each stage of the student's uh, progress. And that's what we're doing. Um, we're looking at the momentum that can be gained with earning more college credits early. And of course, increasing that percent of students who get through their gateway college math and English courses. Um, and then um, as you can see, uh, increasing uh, persistence um, and completion rates. And from here, Julio is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the availability of data to the college. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, uh, when we try to, to implement uh, a strategy uh, that going to bring data to people, um, we, I, I like to always to go back to when this start. And uh, the conversation start around 2012. Uh, when we uh, joined Achieving the Dream, um, there was the need to identify what information do we want? Uh, what, what are we measuring? What, what, is, what is going to tell us that what we are doing is, is right or is going in the right uh, way or in the right direction? Um, also, how are we going to put all this information? How are we going to develop the, 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 the structure for the information to be shared with people? and to have it on time. And I mean, I, I know that one of the questions that we have here is, do you know the people from IR? But uh, it's great, I have a lot of friends in, in the college, I, I love that. But uh, also they don't need to be waiting for me to give them the report, right? They need to have something at the fingerprints that they can work and they can uh, have something actionable. Uh, and then we can develop more if they need we can uh, have a coffee also, uh, well, a virtual coffee now, uh, and, uh, and work about the data and start to look at how we translate this information into an action, right? Then um, during the period, during that period, 2012, 2015, there was the, the, the option for us to look for a, a platform that would allow us to do that interaction. And the, the choice was to, to go for a, with a, SharePoint uh, business intelligence site that we call Achievement Analytics. And Achievement Analytics is a website, is, is a SharePoint website, but it's a little bit different than, than the one that we have in, in, the, in the regular uh, Microsoft Office suite. 
because this website is in premise. This means it's in a server in the college and it's protected information, uh, but allow us to do a lot of things that are great. For example, aut automate. Automate reports that connect the information directly to the databases. Then you, at, as a faculty or as a staff or as a part of the administration, can go to the website, can click a couple buttons there and can get the information real time. Uh, one of the things that was important is, well, if you are talking about enrollment, enrollment is changing every, every minute, right? Especially the, the Friday before starting classes, like everybody decide to enroll and re-enroll and, and drop, et cetera. Then what we decide is, okay, let's keep the data as, as the yesterday night, right? The data is from, from uh, the data that we have today is the data from, from uh, Monday night. And, everybody seeing the same information because that facilitated the communication. Sometimes, many times, uh, uh, they're trying to make decisions in, in conflict or uh, some, um, some uh, what we'll say problems that we can have in communication is because we're not looking at the same thing uh, uh, at the same time, right? Uh, then that was a decision that we made uh, and everybody's clear that the data is as, yesterday night, then uh, we are looking at, at that information set. Um, right now we have more than 400 users and these numbers have been increasing uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the people who access the achievement analytics, they need to have a training where they understand what this information is there, how to use it, what they can share, like it's shareable uh, with, uh, for all the employees, but uh, there is information there that, that has information of, about IDs of students and how, how we handle that, right? Then I, uh, I have a couple of slides here of material analytics, but I want to show you how this website looks like. Then let me just get out of here and go to the actual website. Then um, to connect to the website, you need to have a, a virtual machine or you need to be on campus. And as I was saying, you need to have a training to join, to join the website and start to look at the information. There's a lot of information here because the information is for the whole college, right? We have information for leadership. We have information for staff. We have information for faculty. Uh, information go from enrollment, uh, course scheduling, information of census day because that is important for reporting information about the student success, uh, information about admissions and surveys. For example, in surveys, we, we have a calendar there. Then people know what surveys are being sent. Then we don't send 20 surveys to the students during the same week, right? They don't want to answer and they're going to uh, be like, I already answered these uh, four times. Then this allows to have some, some um, control about what information we are getting and then start to use it, right? If um, one of these assessments is going to be done, uh, we also have a reference of uh, if went to an IRB, who is going to be the lead of these, who if, in case that we want a report to look for it, uh, who's going to be uh, working with this information. Then um, let me go back to achievement analytics. And, and talk about a uh, course success. And when we talk about course success, sorry, but excuse me. First, we talk about program review and I want to show you just program review, how it looks. Uh, program, when, when faculty want to go and do the pro program review, they can go to the automated site and click on it and select the parameters that they want to see. For example, they are looking for something for accounting right? And they are going to look for certain courses. Let me just click one and just apply. And the report is going to be there. Sometimes depending on our computer, our internet connection, sometimes take a little bit longer time, right? Uh, then we, we no, normally mention when we look for a report here, uh, click and then go to get a coffee and come back. And, and, and that, that normally helps. Uh, 
but the information is there, right? Then that is the important piece. Uh, this data is, again, is coming from, from, the, from the databases, is automated. And if they have any question, they can go and, and contact us and start to look at what the information they are getting and how, how this information is related or relevant for their work. Now, let me go back to the course success. And just to clarify, it, I mean, uh, uh, you probably by now know that English is my second language. Yeah, I'm a proud American born in Mexico uh, a long, long time ago. I'm going to stop that there. But also, uh, I get really excited about course success, and you probably hear it in my voice. Uh, then sometimes people uh, struggle to understand me because my accent, second, because I'm an economist, hard to understand, and third, because I get excited. Then, well, uh, I still get excited because this information I feel is important uh, for the, the heart of the, of the college, right? What we are trying to do is in general, I feel like that's why we are here to try to help the students, right? To try to help them to progress in their goal and persist in their, in their academic goal. Then um, we generate reports that allow to see how the students are doing by class. And these faculty can go and look at it and see how many students are passing what percentage of them are being successful with see or better, yeah? That is important because you go and look at the course that you are teaching and see what is the overall and compare it with your own work. But uh, in institutions uh, like ours, um, there is a lot going on. Not just we are teaching classes, we also are developing uh, a prerequisite program, like, like the case of Justin, that every time that I see the, the, his presentation, the numbers are, are great, right? Also, we have other programs. We have tutoring programs. Or other institutions have uh, generation one trailblazers, trio students, uh, first gen students, uh, initiatives that have to do with, um, with uh, diversity and inclusion. Then. One part that I, 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 I like a lot about what we have here is the student success projects. Because there, what we're going to evaluate is not just how the student did in the class, is how many students are, are working in all these other areas and are being impacted by a tutoring or are part of the prerequisite in math or prerequisite in English or are uh, participating in something that we call OERs, uh, Open uh, Educational Resources, or uh, are be getting uh, an email from the early alert system saying, hey, is everything okay? We know that you are uh, missing classes or this, uh, this uh, assessment you have not complete. Then we have also uh, evaluations of all these things. To make the evaluation, we first go and talk to the people that want to do the evaluation, what are working with this program, and say, okay, let's first define what you are doing, how this is impacting the students, and then how we're going to measure that that is successful. Yeah? Uh, that is what we call outputs, uh, what we are doing. Uh, do we have a measure of satisfaction? Do we have a measure of behavior? Like students, because they are participating in this, they are doing that. So because they are receiving this email, they are now going to uh, tutoring. And then uh, how many of them pass the class, withdraw the class, are retained, or persist in, the part, in their pathway? Then this allows to have a framework in a common, um, measures with the different initiatives to know that students in several initiatives or in certain initiatives are performing better than the rest or are not. Uh, something that we notice is, well, we have all these initiatives. The truth is we are not working in silos. 
is not just the tutor students or the early alert students or the prerequisite students, our Columbus State students. And one student at the same time can be participating in multiple of that initiatives. Then there is where we try to break the silo and try to see how many students participate in more than one of these, of these projects, of these programs, of these initiatives that we have uh, developed by faculty, staff, leadership. That prompt, what we have here, that is part of what we have been doing uh, in Columbus State. We start with the question saying, okay, what happened with the students that participate in more of these projects or programs that we have? Is more participation better results? And in this case, we are talking about real engagement because it's not just that they came to an event. They came to an event, a social event in, in campus, but they also came and look at the financial wellness uh, seminars and also participate or are taking the corrective class. Then what we try to see is how the participation is impacting the student success. And we have several measures in between them, course success, GPA, and retention. And what we try to do is, okay, this student participate during this semester in how many? One, two, three, four, or none. And what we noticed was something really interesting. Um, students who participate in three or more initiatives, they have higher success, higher retention, a higher persistence in their goal. Moreover, what we are having, what you are just seeing here is a, a disaggregation that try to look at the students that are black or African-American, that is the, the lower lane here, that participate in three, in less than three initiatives. You're going to notice that the course success, sorry, the retention is lower during the time. This is persistence with the, with the all the way until 2020. White students that participate in less than three initiatives also have a, a persistence of 64, 69%. Now, it's black or African American students who are participating in three or more initiatives, in particular starting in 2015 by now, to now, their persistence is similar, pretty, pretty close to white students. Uh, why we pick 2015? Because in 2015, we expand some of the initiatives like orientation, and we start to, uh, to work in, in other projects that were, we were able to measure in a more consistent way. Yeah. Then this is, this is something interesting because it's bringing not just our participation as faculty, our participation and staff, is our particip participation as, as college and is all of us. When we tie all this together, we start to notice that uh, that participation in multiple initiatives is impacting the, uh, the, the number, the percentage of students that are achieving uh, the college goals. In particular, I'm going to talk about college math and English. Um, the percentage that of students that have complete gateway college math in English doing the same, uh, and both at the same time, uh, during the same year has been increasing. Uh, the last data that we have here is 2019 because we are still evaluating uh, what happened during the pandemic. Really promising in terms of closing gaps, even if the last cohort was a, a decline of 1%, but still, the progress for Black or African American students has increased. For uh, low income students that we uh, use a proxy, uh, that means is we use Pell grant. Uh, Pell students have been growing con consistently uh, in the math completion compared to not Pell students. In a Black or African American students in completing English, also that trend has been increasing 
and it's on a consistent increase of five points since 2015. Then great, great data, great information that we are seeing. Now, the next point, point is how we communicate in these strategies that we use to communicate and engage the college with all this. And I leave you with Kelly, Kelly Hogan. Thank you, Julio. Um, and I think the best way to show your appreciation for the data is to share um, the story of, of the data and the impact on students. And, um, and the way to do that, or the way we've tried to do that anyway, is uh, by communication and engagement and a couple different strategies. So um, really pre-pandemic, we were doing um, data summits uh, once or twice a year where uh, we would all be in a big room together and we would, you know, be demonstrating the data at this, and then having small group conversations about what we were seeing. Um, but we've also had some, and, and that was kind of the big overall, big picture college data, um, which was very important. What we then also added to that um, was our third Friday campus conversations. And those we have continued, we just now do them um, over Zoom or Teams. Um, those conversations, um, they happen usually on a Friday morning um, and we will have a topic put forth about a month in advance so folks can sign up if they have an interest in a particular topic and what we do is you know we again reiterate the the goals uh uh as we we've, we've shown today and then we talk about a specific intervention and the data that we're seeing um and then we engage folks in conversation we'll have small breakout rooms and then come back together we may also be seeking further information trying to delve a little bit deeper but but we are facilitating facilitating conversations about what we see happening and how we can continue to help students um, be successful. We also make sure we disaggregate the data so that we're looking at different student groups. So um, we have we have a couple coming up, uh, one uh, at the end of this week, uh, which is going to be focused on how we um, intend to use what we've learned about uh, our best strategies for supporting students as we think about our new Columbus Promise program uh, for Columbus City School graduates um, who will be coming to Columbus State in the fall, um, you know, who are fully scholarship to do that um, for their first two years uh, or the first the two year degree um, and and trying to really have a conversation about what those best practices are and how we want to, you know, together faculty, staff, administrators work together to ensure that we have everything in place to, uh, you know, from connection through completion uh, to help these students. And then we've got one in a, a few weeks that is going to be focused on um, our adult students, our, our single parents. So we have a uh, single parent uh, grant, single mother's grant uh, that we've been working on for a year. And from that has come a series of recommendations, uh, short term, long term. And we're going to have a campus conversation about supporting our um, single parents uh, going forward and the strategies around that. And we want, again, more conversation and input. And we will also have students um, who have participated in focus groups who will be following up in that session as well. It's always important to have that student voice. Um, so those are a couple of ways in which we, you know, facilitate campus conversations. Um, and I will say, you know, getting people together in a room is great. By actually doing some of this electronically, we've been able to engage some folks who maybe we would not have, you know, with multiple campuses, sometimes it's hard to get where you need to be or just the timing. Um, these strategies in the, the Zoom world, sometimes, sometimes they um, are actually helpful in certain situations. And then we also have our student success web page, and I think Julio is able to pull that up. Um, and we have um, uh, been able to, as you can see on the panel on the right there, from connection, entry, progress, completion, and so forth. In each of those sections, we talk about some of our strategies um, and we'll, we'll focus on maybe a particular intervention or something we're doing there to kind of demonstrate what it is that we're paying attention to and how it's impacting students and their success. Um, when we did entry, we were focusing on um, our co-requisite English and our co-requisite mathematics courses, um, and then also our first four week strategy. And so we do these short uh, videos to um, help engage the audience as well. And so that folks can hear from 
faculty, from staff uh, who are intimately involved with these projects. And then when, when we can, we also include the student voice uh, in those videos as well. And actually, um, we premiere these videos at, um, at our uh, first Wednesday uh, gathering. So the first Wednesday of the month, the president hosts a, a large convening. And uh, so several times a semester, we will highlight a certain practice or program that has demonstrated success. And we premiere it there and then we'll usually put it on one of these pages um, or share it out as appropriate. Uh, we wanna share one of our latest uh, with you. And that is our success minute video on our OER. Uh, it, it's a great way to use your data um, and your and your voices of your of your um, employees who've really been um, working hard on these things to um, really elevate the conversation and the understanding of the particular intervention. So here's uh, the latest on OERs at Columbus State. What is OER? OER is an acronym that stands for Open Educational Resources. They can be in the form of a complete course, a module of instruction, or an ebook that is available for use by anyone. Some usage restrictions can apply, though, and those are defined by Creative Commons licensing. Faculty can use OER partially or in full. Often, faculty add to existing OER with their own content. Through a process known as digitization, faculty have collaborated with instructional designers in Digital Education and Instructional Services, or DEIS, to develop original engaging assets like videos called learning objects, plus interactive multimedia experiences and assessments called course enhancements. When that development is done, all the new content becomes OER as well. Columbus State is eight years into our work on digitization, ebooks, and OER. Our faculty, instructional designers, and librarians are now veterans in this interdepartmental effort. That expertise is the direct result of the investment the college has made in its future and the thousands of people hours that faculty and staff have directly contributed to its growth and ongoing success. The ultimate goal is to decrease student cost and increase student engagement with and access to freely available learning content. Institutional data reflect the positive academic outcomes of Columbus State courses using OER compared to the general population. Looking at autumn terms from 2016 to 2020, student retention rates for autumn to spring semesters were higher across the board. Likewise, autumn to autumn student retention was higher through all five years. Given the focus on student affordability, as well as demonstrated impact on student success and retention, OER clearly align with the college's key completion goals, one of which is to increase the percent of students who persist from their first year to their second year. Students in courses using OER persist at a higher rate than their peers who are not using OER. And for a glimpse into a possible future of OER at Columbus State, here is Professor Jean Strickland from the Art, Media, and Design Department discussing the new Z degree in digital photography. A Z degree, also known as a ZTC degree for zero textbook cost, is a program or a set of courses that allows a student to earn a degree, certificate, or credential that has no textbook cost. Now the biggest upfront challenge to creating an entire degree or even a set of courses that has zero textbook cost is the work it takes to do it. And I'm lucky to have had so much tremendous support from so many faculty and staff across our organization. This work is going on across our entire campus. Now, Z degrees are important and benefit students in many ways. Aside from just saving students money, studies have shown that OER Z degrees courses increase student equity and improve student retention. The high cost of textbooks negatively impacts student access, success, and completion. Now, our digital photography program received some national recognition over the past two years. In 2021, our digital photography program was listed as the number one pick of the 43 top photography programs in the nation by intelligent.com. I do not think it's a coincidence that this happened during the overarching program redesign to create a Z degree. OER and ZTC courses and degree innovations here at Columbus State represents a commitment by our institution to support another tool for student success. Thank you. So you can see that when you can um, really highlight some of these successful strategies, it really gains attention um, of, of the folks who are, um, you know, maybe unfamiliar with that particular strategy. And so now they really have a better understanding. And it also um, 
you know, really gives a real pat on the back to those who've been uh, intimately involved with the work around that, um, which which is also a bit of a motivator as well. So, um, so we're always excited to, to share those. Um, and these videos or a number of the more recent ones are um, located on the success webpage if you would like to see to see more of them. And they are very collaborative. Um, we, we work on uh, scripting those together um, so that we are we are sure to have those, those key elements, the data, the activity, the uh, the purpose behind um, and so forth. So with that, um, uh, we would love to open it up to uh, questions. And I do see a few in the chat. So Erica. Um, Turn it back over to you. Sure, we'll start with the ones in the chat, and then we also have um, some prompts. If um, you know anybody has, um, you know, we have some time left at the end. But I wanted to start off with two for the Columbus State team, um, Julio. One, there was a question about how the participation, student participation data, is collected at your institution. So, is it advisors or a part of a student survey? How is that done? Then, great question, and um, I, I call this um, job security, right? <laughs> the, the data is collected by a series of systems. Uh, tutoring is in tutor track, and we also have a, a tool called NetTutor, and there is some data. We have data in, in a system called Starfish. Uh, we have other, another one uh, called uh, Blumen. Uh, we have a series of systems. Then what we try to do is, um, and that is the work of the office, is we know where the data is. Now we connect that information. We pull the information, uh, lives with us, and then we connect that to the student information system, to colleague so far is the, the system that we have. And, and with that, because we, can, we have achieved analytics, that connection that we have, we can post the reports and automate the reports uh, with all these different sources. Now, let me tell you, sometimes the participation is collected by paper and pencil. Uh, still, I mean, because it's an event and uh, students just come, sign the, 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 the list. Well, what I ask is just send me the paper and pencil and I, 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 I take care of that. Uh, then uh, we, we have it in multiple systems. What we try to do is, 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 is uh, the information coming, coming to us. Uh, and if I can say something, um, let me just tell you uh, something that happened a long time ago. Uh, when I start to work in the office, uh, I start to look for where the data was, right? Um, then um, I went to several offices and say, I know that you guys are doing this. Can I have the data? And they were like, wait, who are you? Why you are asking us for, this is my information. What? <laughs> then uh, the communication that the strategies that, highlight, uh, that uh, Kelly highlight um, have opened to the community to know this is our information. We share it. Uh, it's okay, Julio can, can have it uh, or somebody else in the office uh, or my colleagues there. Um, and and make, can make that, that uh, that process more smooth and still there is challenges, but, uh, but we have now a system that, that allows to collect all that. Thanks Julio. And we have a, a similar experience where we kind of have these disparate sources of information that we have to bring together in order to get all of it kind of in one centralized spot. And we actually took a page out of you all's book and um, now have a student engagement platform where we're trying to build out how we track some of that information. So that, that was wonderful. I think there was one um, for you all that touched on your uh, your data warehouse and your so it says um, is the tool an institutional product or a vendor purchased um, product and then you know kind of trying to understand you know any of the pitfalls so any resistance from institutional members um, from the launch of those from launch to that kind of analysis um, and if so what were those kind of hiccups or, or organizational depressions as it was mentioned in the chat. Yeah, well, the tool uh, Achievement Analytics is a SharePoint site. And if you are familiar with Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, has SharePoint, right? You have Outlook and you have SharePoint. What we have is a version that is, 
is set up in our campus instead of being in the cloud. Then, uh, yeah, it, that, that part is a vendor. Uh, but the development of achievement analytics was ours. Uh, the, was the, the, the people in the office uh, that start to develop uh, and start to work with uh, our uh, database administrator uh, to, to ensure how to connect all the information and how to secure the information uh, there. Um, we also have a, a data warehouse and there we have a vendor for um, data that is time, um, uh, time sequence. This means the data that, that um, is an achievement analytics can be from yesterday night, as I was saying, colleague, or can be set up at certain day in certain period of time. For example, August 2015, uh, 20, August 26, right? Because that was census day that, uh, for that year. Yeah? Then uh, we have a vendor uh, that is called Sogotech uh, and that, that allows to store and manipulate the, the information. Um, about resistance, uh, I feel like uh, at the beginning, people are, were not used to, yeah? uh, to see all the information then to have it there. But now, I mean, it's, uh, it's almost a common day and a common team in any uh, meetings is a start of, okay, what is the data? Okay, let's start from there and then let's start to, to talk about, about what, how we can develop this. Yeah, and ours was a similar, um, a similar kind of under transition, I guess, right? So as Kelly put in the chat in that culture shift, um, I'll share you, with you because there were some questions about um, what we have at Lorraine. Um, I'll share with you two of our dashboards, but you know we can certainly tour anything. This is what you see on the screen is our What Matters Most metrics. There are 31 metrics included within here. Um, you see that it is live. There was a question about our English completion rate, so that just happens to be the one that I pulled up. But you see our lost momentum framework that Kelly referenced as well. Um, and down here, what we do is provide the, the actual numbers for context. So of our kind of overall population, but also those that are included in that um, as a success or kind of in the metric as completing, um, if you will. So that way, you know, it's very transparent in the volume of folks as well as the success. So when we know when we're moving the lever or something looks volatile, we can go down and peel back the layers to say, okay, was it because our end was really small and so it's more susceptible to kind of those fluctuations or just what is going on there. Um, so we do have all of that information out there. We have um, some deeper kind of level information about our English and let me move this back up top um, and math as well and our transfer detail information. So that's all in this one kind of one stop shop. Um, so we can look at where folks are transferring out, what programs they're going into, um, any kind of analytics that we want to see there. So I wanted to share that one. And then there was also a question kind of related to some of our program review type stuff. Um, this is our dashboard for program review that has, it's set right now default to everybody. Um, but you can see in here, we track that bachelor's degree attainment at the um, at the program level. So again, while the settings are all, that's all in here, folks know where their students are going, um, what programs they're going into and whether or not they completed. We have grad tracking information. So we know where, you know, kind of what jobs our, our students are getting within the certain programs. Um, so we can connect with employers and things like that. Um, so just wanted to kind of quickly share that because there were some questions about that. I'm going to stop sharing because there was a question for all of us. Oh, and one thing I wanted to point out in our um, in our analytics, we're moving towards setting goals for the overall student population. So we're moving away from kind of comparing um, different groups with each other or against each other, I guess, is to kind of what is the bar of excellence that we want to achieve for all of the student populations, no matter what kind of disaggregated population they're in. Um, so that's going to be what we'll see in the next iteration of our What Matters Most metrics. But um, 
All right, and those are all accessible to faculty and staff. Um, Julio, do you want to talk about your professional development for faculty? Because that's, or Kelly, um, you know, that's one of the questions that came up. I know ours we do at our faculty development days. Um, we have some office hour type times where we're, where we're working with faculty members to get them familiarized with this. We kind of do it both in a scheduled way and then in, in kind of an ad hoc way as folks need it. So great questions. But, Columbus State, want to chime in on that? Kelly, I, I don't know uh, if you want me to, to take a, a little. Um, my, my understanding, and, and again, I probably uh, should refer this to Kelly, uh, is that there is a faculty professional development group, and uh, there is uh, an emphasis in active and collaborative learning, equity and inclusion, and uh, I remember that there is four pillars, but now I remember just two. Kelly, can you help me there? <laughs> yeah, I, I can uh, uh, grab the website and put it in. Um, but yeah, the the faculty de professional development. Well, first of all, for achievement analytics, there's there's a training anybody on campus can sign up for, so that they can learn. Uh, and I think those sessions are just an hour or so. Um, you could probably go a little deeper, um, like a level two, get into some of the BI stuff. But um, but you have to have training before you can have access to the system. Uh, which only makes sense. But then the faculty professional development initiative is led by faculty. Um, and then uh, they they have kind of um, really, especially during the pandemic, really move forward um, on the, on those different pillars um, to uh, ensure that, you know, everyone, especially now that everyone was really, or most were pushed online uh, somewhat unexpectedly, would have the necessary tools to have, um, uh, the courses and the instructional methods uh, ready to, to take on that challenge. I wanted to add about to what um, Erica said about Lorraine, in addition to actual sort of faculty development events, I think that um, one of the most impactful ways that I as a faculty member have been taught to, you know, to look at and to think about data as far as my own program goes is the more robust program review process that we've developed over the last few years. So that when, for example, the writing program is up for review, which, which it is this year, actually, I mean, I, I've received a workbook that includes a lot of the data that, um, that Erica collects and has presented here today. And, and that workbook also then includes, you know, instructions look at this data and it, it includes some prompting questions that lead me and my colleagues in the english department to think about this data what it means what we can do about it what we can do with it um, and then once we fill out that workbook a part of the review process is um, to do a public session so that we share with anybody who wants to attend um, this information about our program and how we're making use of the information that um, Erica and her colleagues in IR have given us. And so it's not exactly professional development in, in the strictest sense, but it is this really wonderful way that we're guided through the use of data. And um, you can go to these public sessions to see what other people are doing with the data and, and get ideas and sort of be inspired in that way. And I think that that's really created um, uh, a fantastic culture at our in own institution about you know paying attention to data and making use of making use of data. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Justin. Um, and there was a question in the chat about how many people it takes to pull this off. <laughs> and uh, that's always the million dollar question, right? Um, so at Lorraine, we have three FTEs that are a part of our institutional research planning and engagement office. Um, so we kind of split up the work that way. Julio, how, what's the size of your team? Uh, our team is, 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 is large. Um, we have a, our um, vice president, uh, the director. We are, have four analysts um, and, and a program manager. It's, it's, it's large. Um, but here's something that I, I, I probably would like to, to emphasize. Um, we show all this data, all this uh, numbers, uh, surveys, uh, we, we, we have all, all this information, but all the nice dash for everything that we have needs to start with a question, with a, with a human interaction that is a contacting the people that have the data and start with a talk, right? Uh, and even if you have just one person, uh, 
go and, and talk and say, okay, this is what I want to see. And this is what, what I want to know, right? Uh, and this is what I'm doing. And that interaction, that, that is first step that is, yeah, I try to reflect that in that uh, in the evaluation program that, that we do. Uh, in, that interaction will lead to work that uh, you don't need to reinvent our website or reinvent uh, the, all that uh, dashboard and all the work that has been developed in Lorraine and other places. What you need is, is a question of what, what you are doing and what, where you want to see and where you want to go. And with that, it's working, working smart to, to, to go in, in, in that way. Uh, and uh, in terms of, 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 of uh, sharing, like, like uh, Justin and, and, and Erica say, I mean, we don't have all the answers and we are here, uh, but we want to share what we, what we have, right? Yeah, I, I agree and I appreciate that. Kelly, did you have something to add? I'll just say one other thing. So, um, you know, there are some opportunities to learn more about data and, you know, the state, um, for example, like your funding model. It's it's kind of, I don't want to say convoluted, but it's 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 complicated, right? Um, but uh, if you are a member of OACC, which I'm guessing many of you are, for example, they have the SSLI coming up, the Student Success and Leadership Institute um only a, a week or two away and um it's those types of opportunities are also a great way to think about you know the data that you're looking at also thinking about you know i mean quite honestly thinking about your funding model too right and the data that's going to go to the state and how that's used in comparison with the other community colleges and then there's also the 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 point at which then um, there are presentations at those things about what what your peers at those institutions are doing like justin has shared you know they're going to highlight certain um uh certain practices that have led at their institutions to success among certain populations so again engaging in some of those and those activities happen pretty regularly um so i, I would just encourage if you haven't done those before or uh, because usually every community college sends a small team um to look into that opportunity as well because it'd be a great follow-up to this because you'd really be expanding further in looking at um, the use of data and thinking about equity and student success. Yeah, and I know Valerie, you asked in there if it's important to kind of have a course or a background. You know, I think um, if nothing else, I'm hoping that Julio and I conveyed that, you know, we, most IR staff are, are really willing to help talk through um, any of the data and the analytics and questions that you might have. So it's really kind of the support squad. Um, and with that note, I think Laura has got a survey uh, link that she's gonna drop in the chat. That's the evaluation for our workshop today. Um, so if, before you hop off, if you could click that link and make sure you complete that, let us know how we did. Um, we would really appreciate that. And with that, 